gives me a great uh, pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Quorum Nasir. Quorum is, uh, is an MD, uh, got his uh, Master's of Public Health at Johns Hopkins. He's been uh, extremely uh, helpful in all the research work that we've done at the Chikorone Center. Dr. Aaron Mikos, who's published a lot in the field of uh, atherosclerosis imaging and risk prediction, uh, uh, and I have worked uh, closely with Quorum over the years, and he's going to present sort of the, the keynote uh, talk tonight uh, that will get us started about the global burden of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, current paradigms for identifying uh, the asymptomatic vulnerable patient, time for a change. Quorum? Thank you, Roger. Uh, I would like to thank everybody for joining us tonight. So the topic of my presentation is, what is the global burden of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease and current paradigms for identifying those with, who are asymptomatic vulnerable patient, and is it a time for a change? In my presentation today, I will discuss how big cardiovascular disease is an issue in both developed and developing worlds. We'll also discuss a bit about current strategies that are advocated for primary prevention of heart disease and assess trends in heart disease-related mortality as well as incidence as an indicator of how effective our preventive programs have been. We'll also critically recognize the limitations of current guidelines and where exactly they fail us. And finally, open the discussion for potential strategies that may improve our ability to detect this vulnerable patients will be discussed in greater detail by our next speakers. So if I ask anybody in this room what is the number one killer disease in developed world, including North America, it's a no-brainer. We all know heart disease is the leading cause of death, claiming approximately one million lives in U.S. alone. However, there exist several myths that heart disease is more limited to developed and wealthy nations. Whereas if you look, even about 15 years ago, the burden of heart disease was equally distributed between developed and developing nations. In the next 15 years, there's estimated 25 million people will die of stroke or heart disease. And only 20% of the burden will be in the developed world, whereas the rest would be shared by low and middle income countries. In a recent editorial by Dr. Fuster in Circulation, he pointed out the fact that cardiovascular disease is a major cause of death in working class groups in developing countries just portends a huge economic consequence. For example, in South Africa, of all the cardiovascular disease death, 35% occur in those who are 35 to 64 years of age, whereas in India, the respective prevalence is about 35%. Now compare that to US and other parts of Europe, that percentage is only within 10 to 12 percent range. And he rightly pointed out that any plan that is needed to tackle poverty in these regions need to have, need to deal with premature cardiovascular disease. Looking at the economic impact of coronary heart disease and stroke in U.S. alone, it is estimated that it results in over $200 billion in direct and indirect costs. And that's more than the budget of many developing nations. Considering the high cost associated with the heart disease and stroke, it is imperative that we improve our ability to identify the asymptomatic high risk in which effective preventive strategies can be initiated. However, a major hindrance in our preventive efforts is in identifying those with underlying heart disease is that in more than 50 percent, the first presentation of the disease by itself is myocardial infarction or sudden cardiac death. As a result, we lose the opportunity for a primary prevention and also preventing the huge economic consequences associated with these diseases. So knowing how big the burden is, what do we do or what are our current strategies in identifying these asymptomatic individuals? If you look at the current guidelines, all major advisory bodies, including National Cholesterol Education Program, American Heart Association, ACC, recommend that adults should undergo an office-based assessment for the development of heart disease. 
And one approach that is uniformly recommended is to derive a risk prediction model based on the historic Framingham Heart study that takes into account five major risk factors, age, total cholesterol, your HDL, blood pressure levels, and smoking status. I would add gender to this list because different weightages are given to these risk factors depending upon whether one is male or female. Based on this risk factor, in general, a 10-year risk or estimate is determined for developing heart disease. And again, based on that, individuals can be broadly classified into three categories. At one end of the spectrum are those who have a 10-year risk that is less than 10%. They're considered at low risk. The guidelines recommend to reassure them of their underlying cardiovascular disease status and to avoid any further risk assessment for at least five years. On the other hand of the spectrum are those with a very high risk. They have greater than 20% 10 year risk of having a heart disease. And then there are candidates for aggressive management for all risk factors with very stringent LDL goals of less than 70 milligrams per deciliter, as well as candidates for aspirin therapy. Mind you, if someone is diabetic or has peripheral artery disease, they would be in this category irrespective of their baseline Framingham risk score. However, nearly 40% of the adult population are neither low risk or high risk. They fall into this intermediate category. And in spite of the fact that they have at least one to two major known CHD risk factors, they do not qualify for most intensive interventions and would be candidates for lipid lowering management only if their LDL is greater than 160, which only less than one third of the population fit into. So these are the current guidelines. In the next few slides, I'll just review the trends in the incidence of heart disease as well as the mortality as a parameter of how well we are doing in this area. Three years ago, uh, investigators from Tulane looked at trends in mortality and incidence of acute myocardial infarction in a U.S. representative population over a period extending from 1971 to 1992 in two 10-year points. The author noticed that from 82 to 92, there was almost halving of the mortality rate related to acute myocardial infarction. However, no such change was found in the incidence of new cases, that is, of acute myocardial infarction, suggesting that, yes, there have been great strides made in secondary prevention, but in that same era, we have fared poorly in primary prevention. In a similar manner, trends in heart disease mortality and incidence in ERIC study, which is a large population-based cohort in U.S., was studied from 1987 to 94. They echoed similar findings that, yes, there has been a change, reduced CH-related mortality, more in men as compared to women, but no such change over this seven-year period found in new cases of heart disease. Recent data that has been published by American Heart Association showed almost similar trend that over a 25 years period, there has been a gradual reduction in cardiovascular disease mortality, mainly in men. But if you look at women, there has been actually an increase, and the slight reduction in events have been noticed after 2000. Now, if that's due to reduced incidence of case, or are we imp there is improved secondary prevention and preventing that after the disease occur, we don't, I can't really say, because there is not much data about the incidence after 94. However, we can extrapolate some data from UK, which looked at incidence per 1,000 population over 10 years, and this was recently published in European Heart Journal. In this graph, you can notice that there has been a gradual reduction, mainly after 2001, which I believe coincides with the new guidelines that came, which had more stringent LDL goals, diabetics were considered CHD equivalent and were more liberal with recommending lipid lowering medication. At least there's some hope that it's coming down. However, if you look at in subgroups according to age, the major reduction in CHD incidence was mainly limited to those aged above 55, a change that's not that great, 2 to 4% reduction. But in young individuals, 
and especially women, there's actually been an increase in CHD incidence. So knowing the fact that, yes, we are doing well with reducing CHD mortality, but we fail poorly in reducing the new incidence, the question you need to ask, why this risk factor-based approach is not helping us to reduce new onset CHD, and where they do fail us. Among many others, one important cause is there is significant overlap in risk factors among who develop versus don't develop heart disease. For example, in the Framingham Heart Study, in a 26-year follow-up, the data revealed that 80% of individuals who developed and did not develop heart disease had the same cholesterol level. And in fact, 50% of cases who develop heart disease had normal cholesterol. Clearly, we need better markers to identify risk. Secondly, the current CHD risk assessment methods significantly underestimate risk in women. And this point can be exemplified by looking at the distribution of Framingham risk scores in U.S. national representative population. You can see that if in men, 60% above age 50 to 59, and almost everybody age 60 to 69 fall into the, at least the intermediate risk category under a scope where some preventive efforts could be initiated. Whereas compared to that, none of the women less than 50 are intermediate risk. Only 1% who are 50 to 59 fall into that category compared to 9% 60 to 69. All of the rest are considered low risk. I think so this in part may explain why there has been less decline in mortality as well as incidence in women because the current risk factors significantly underestimate risk in this vulnerable population. Thirdly, I think age is a very big factor in the calculation of your Framingham risk score, and this was very nicely demonstrated by Lloyd Jones last year at AHA, that among young males and females who are smoking, even a cholesterol of greater than 300, HDL less than 200, and very high systolic blood pressure would not put them into the very high risk category by Framingham risk score, more so in women. I'm sure everybody would think differently and treat them more aggressively than what Framingham risk score would do. Fourthly, the focus of current base guidelines are more on short to intermediate term rather than looking at lifelong and relative risk. As you can see in this table, individuals who have 40 years of age, although they have a high lifetime risk, approximately 36 to 42 percent, they are significantly underestimated in their 10-year risk by Framingham. Although the agreement is not that great among 60-year-olds, but there is not as dis much discordance as compared to less than 40 years. Now, given the emphasis on age and short intermediate absolute risk, existing risk models may not capture young adults like Fatal, but who would have an extreme level, most likely extreme level of subclinical atherosclerosis, all, although having a high long CV risk might have a short term cardiovascular risk and thus missed by the Framingham risk scoring. A very nice study was published four years ago that summarized the deficiencies of uh, these guidelines in a very nice manner. In this study, the authors assessed more than 200 patients, had no previous to heart disease or diabetes, all were young, and these were the ones who presented with their first acute MI. And they asked a simple question. How would Framingham risk categorize them? And it, surprisingly, three-quarters of those were considered low risk. Now think of this. A day before the when they walk into your clinic, you do a Framingham risk score, you give them a clean bill of health, and say everything's fine for at least the next five years, and next day they have this event. Interestingly, women were found to be less likely to be considered for any therapy compared to men because 95% of them were low risk, only 5% were intermediate, and none of them made to the 20% risk, high risk category. In almost similar fashion, our group looked at the prevalence of individuals who would qualify for lipid lowering management based on the current guidelines across increasing level of subclinical atherosclerosis. In this study, 1,600 asymptomatic individuals underwent calcium testing. And although an increasing prevalence of individuals qualifying for pharmacotherapy was seen with increase in burden, but even with severe levels of calcification that is greater than 100 or 400, only 35 and 41 percent qualified for lipid lowering management. 
Thus, we were missing approximately more than 50% of this very high risk person still did, were missed by Framingham Risk School. And we asked a very simple question. Are individuals with the same atherosclerotic burden would be considered equally for pharmacotherapy by these guidelines if they were either old, young, male, or female? And this is what we found. With, in the presence of advanced coronary recalcification, young individuals with the same level of atherosclerosis were at least two times less likely to be eligible for pharmacotherapy. And almost same thing. Only 17% women compared to 33% were eligible for pharmacotherapy. So the scenario is, even with the same level of risk, Framingham risk is severely going to underestimate in young and in women. And one another point, family history of premature heart disease, which I'm sure everybody would consider a very strong risk factor, it's not part of the Framingham risk estimation. Although studies again and again have shown that presence of family history is associated with two to three time risk of heart disease. Our group looked at more than 8,000 individuals who underwent chronic calcification, and we found that even in presence of zero or one risk factor, nearly a quarter or one-third of individuals who have family history, especially in a sibling, would have significant atherosclerosis and thus grossly underestimated by current guidelines. And these findings were validated in a large prospective-based study that not only family history is a risk factor in Caucasian population, but the risk is same across all ethnic groups. And in fact, even among low-risk individuals, at least a quarter of them have significant atherosclerosis. Even if they're reassured, nearly one-fourth of them would have high level of disease. So based on this, now how can we further improve on these risk strategies to identify the vulnerable patient? This, was where, this point was very nicely pointed about that's enabled by at NHLBI in the four Ps of the future of cardiovascular risk. First, improving our predictive ability to identify those who are at high risk, focus on preventive efforts in delaying the onset of heart disease rather than secondary prevention, and these efforts should be preemptive long before clinical apparent disease appear, and it should be personalized by using accurate markers on our understanding of cardiovascular pathophysiology to tailor these strategies to individual needs. Now, if we consider atherosclerosis to be the major underlying culprit of heart disease, if you look at the natural history from a point where it, initiation of atherosclerosis to where it progress, becomes unstable, ruptures, occludes a coronary artery, causes an event, in most individuals, there's going to be a long latent period where they have subclinical atherosclerosis without any sign and symptoms. And if we can improve our identification of these vulnerable individuals, it will supplement the current risk stratification strategies. So I'll just like to summarize my presentation. Uh, it's well established that both developed and developing societies are vulnerable to heart disease. There is a significant loss of economic growth with cardiovascular disease, especially in developing countries. Unfortunately, the first manifestation of heart disease in nearly 50% of cases is an acute myocardial infarction or sudden cardiac death. Although we have seen a reduction in cardiovascular disease mortality in the last two decades or so, unfortunately, we have fared poorly as far as primary prevention is concerned. And current guidelines recommend to use risk factor-based logarithms like Framingham to assess cardiovascular disease, but unfortunately, it significantly underestimates risk in young and women. Also, the presence or absence of risk factors do not differentiate either your current or your future risk of heart disease accurately. Also, a major limitation of this risk factor-based approach is that the focus is short-term on absolute risk rather than lifelong and relative risk. Family history of premature heart disease, which is not part of the Framingham risk algorithm currently, should be strongly considered as a powerful risk factor. And I leave this question open. Is this the time for a change? And do we actively need to look for underlying disease? And we'll hear more from our next speakers. Thank you so much.